So you've obviously seen the visual theme this morning. Uh, these, these things on the screen are called supercell storms. And they're there because they remind me of the descriptions of the day of the Lord that are found in the Minor Prophets. I mean, the, the descriptions frequently call this day a day of gloom and deep darkness. So, supercell storm, what is it? That's well, a thunderstorm, but it's not your garden variety thunderstorm. A supercell is a large, long-lasting storm with the potential to cause severe damage. They're most common on the Great Plains of the United States and Canada. Gail and Kat and I think we saw one in Minnesota when we were up there on vacation. And the key characteristic of a supercell is what's called a mesocyclone, or meso for short. It, it's, it starts out as a, as a warm, moist updraft, but as it rises into the atmosphere, it encounters shearing winds that come from two different directions at different altitudes, and that causes the updraft to spin, and it turns into a mesocyclone, an, an uplifting cyclone. As a result, several things happen. One is the anvil, the, the layer of clouds at the top of the storm that extends outward far beyond the storm itself. The second is the formation of two substantial downdrafts, the forward flank downdraft and the rear flank downdraft. And it's in these areas, especially on the forward flank, that the severe weather can occur. So that could include hail, strong straight line winds, and not infrequently powerful tornadoes. To cite just one example, a massive supercell tornado outbreak on May 3, 1999, spawned an F5 tornado near Oklahoma City that had the highest winds ever recorded on the planet. That, that same outbreak spawned 66 tornadoes in Oklahoma alone, resulted in 50 fatalities and 895 injuries in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas. So that's a semi-scientific description of a supercell cell storm. But I want you to imagine for the moment that you're in the path of one of these events. You see this massive cloud forming and moving towards you. A, a deeply detailed mass of cloud, often with these shelf-like structures. And, and, and that comes towards you, and then you see this high anvil of clouds streaming past you, forming above it, going over your head, blocking the sun, bringing darkness like an eclipse. And then the wind starts straight into your face at 50 or 60 miles an hour, and then rain driven by that wind, and then hail flung almost horizontally into cars, trees, and structures. And if you could still see out into the storm, you'd then see the most devastating thing of all, a huge F5 tornado twisting from the cloud, touching down, and pulverizing everything. If it's that F5 near Oklahoma City, its winds reach 324 miles an hour, far faster than any hurricane. Homes are lifted completely away. Their debris ground to sand. Trees and shrubs were not uprooted are completely debarked. Vehicles are carried in the air a quarter of a mile or more. In that storm, a 36,000 pound railroad freight car was tumbled over end for three quarters of a mile. Devastating storm. Those of us who recently saw the damage from Hurricane Laura and Lake Charles were appalled by it, but this would be far, far worse, an Armageddon of destruction. And it's this kind of vision that the prophet Joel sees as foreshadowed by the locusts and drought that we've talked about the last few weeks. He warns the people of Judah that a day is coming that will be far, far worse. It's the day of judgment and rescue, which the scripture calls the day of the Lord, or just that day. This morning we want to read what Joel writes, but we also want to hear the other descriptions to convince ourselves that that day of darkness, gloom, and rescue is near. Let's read the whole text. It's not very long. 
that will focus first on the day of the Lord as judgment. Joel 2, 1 through 11. Blow a trumpet on Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been seen before, nor will be again after them through all the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap upon the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their path. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Joel has already instructed the priests to call a Solomon assembly to proclaim a fast because of the locusts, the drought, and the fires. Now I think he raises his eyes and he sees the far, more, the far off judgment coming and he repeats the call in a more urgent way. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Blow the shofar, the ram's horn. This was the traditional trumpet of Israel, sounded ceremonially on the Day of Atonement to bring in the year of Jubilee once every 50 years in Israel. But it was also the trumpet used to hail a new king, the trumpet used to call to battle, and the trumpet used by the watchmen on the walls when an enemy army was approaching. And all those uses can be associated with the Day of the Lord that is coming. Blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, fear. As Joel depicts it here, the day of the Lord is not a thing to be celebrated, but a calamity to be warned of. It's coming, and it is a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. This is a supercell storm of destruction. He warns that an army, like no other, is gathering. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been seen before, nor will be again after them. They gather for this great climactic battle, which Joel will begin to describe later in this book. So he announces the day of the Lord. He announced it in chapter 1. He does so three times in chapter 2, and again in chapter 3. This is obviously a key theme, and as God's people, we need to understand it. It is, in fact, a key theme for several of the minor prophets and even for the prophet Isaiah. This week, I went through all the references to the day of the Lord in all of Scripture and all the references to the shorthand that day, and I want to share some of that with you. But first, I suppose, I owe you a definition. What is the day of the Lord? It is a climactic period of God's judgment or rescue, or the climactic period of God's judgment and rescue. The scriptures either warn of judgment that is coming in that day, or they give us hope of rescue that is at hand. They can be directed at events that are not in the final end times period, or they can be directed exclusively toward that last day, or they can be a combination that looks at a more immediate event, but foreshadows final events. And finally, the day of the Lord is not really a single day. It's a period of time, just as we might say in my day or in my, my grandfather's day, such and so. 
In this chapter, this chapter, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. Joel begins with locusts and drought, but then he raises his eyes. He sees the supercell storm of judgment, the judgment of the end times. Many prophets looked thus into the future and saw judgments, many of which we ourselves have yet to witness. But we need to know this is coming. His prophecies haven't evaporated. They're confirmed by Jesus in his day, and they're confirmed in the book of Revelation. There is yet a day of darkness, gloom, and cloud for our sinful world. Now, we may not like this, but this is the clear teaching of Scripture. Let's look at some. Isaiah 13, wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold, mankind than the gold of Ophir. The minor prophets also see this day of judgment. Amos 5.18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord that is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him? Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? Again, this is the day of the Lord for judgment, Ezekiel 30. Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Wail! Alas for the day, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Zephaniah 1, the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter, the mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. These are not parts of Scripture that we normally read or appreciate, and yet they teach clearly that God will judge sin and sinners. And these prophets uniformly testify that this day of the Lord is near. So what, what does that mean? I know some of the people are writing 3,000 years ago. Well, it can't mean that this prophet's prophecy points both to an immediate fulfillment in some catastrophic but not world-ending judgment, or it can mean that the final judgment looms so high above the prophetic horizon that it seems about to break on the world, near in that sense, just as a tidal wave might look even when far off. Peter in the New Testament agrees. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? That day is also a day of final judgment, Isaiah 24. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison, and after many days or for many days, they will be punished. This, this is the final punishment, their eternal separation from God in hell which is spelled out clearly in the book of Revelation. So here's Joel. He sees the same judgment coming. But having just experienced these plagues of locusts, he pictures that day in a unique way compared to all the other prophets. Verses 3 to 10 describe the horrors that day of that day in locust imagery and in army imagery. 
and in a little bit of traditional prophetic imagery, all designed to create the needed awe and fear of what God's going to do. Verse 3, fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. We said last week that with the locusts and the drought, there was probably also a catastrophic California is burning kind of wildfire in Joel's day. He sees that flame front as the leading edge of the day. This is compelling imagery. One of my favorite lines in the book of Joel's, this next one, the land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness and nothing escapes them. The song we heard two weeks ago, Hear This, paraphrases this. Before them a garden, sweet like Eden, behind them a dry desert waste. The locusts will cut down like fire, the earth shakes, so wake up and wait, but nothing escapes. So Joel is describing the great enemy army of the last battle, Armageddon, which he details later in the book. But his description is in locust language, verse 4. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. The, the literature on desert locusts frequently calls attention to a likeness to horses. I don't see it myself, but many people have. And these reports also mention the sound of a locust invasion. Verse 5, as with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. And the response to locusts in those days is the response to that day that is coming. Before them, people are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Verses 7 and 8, like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each on his way, they do not swerve from their paths, they do not jostle one another, each marches in his path, they burst through the weapons and are not halted. Locusts on the ground tend to march pretty much straight forward in lines to find new food. They're rarely daunted by any weapon brought against them or any defense against their invasion. Verse 9, they leap upon the city, they run upon the walls, they climb up into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. Locust language. And verse 10 reverts to more customary day of the Lord language. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw they're shining. This is a cosmic judgment. Joel repeats that image, the darkening of the sun and moon in chapter 2 and in chapter 3. Ezekiel uses the same image. Peter quotes Joel in Acts chapter 2 using that image, and Jesus says the same thing in his own prophecies. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of that day, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Jesus knew the book of Joel and he affirmed that Joel's prophecy would be fulfilled at his own second coming. In this chapter then, Joel is focusing on the judgment of that day the final judgment that accompanies the return of Christ and precedes the new heavens and the new earth. If we don't understand this from everything Joel said so far, it's clear in our last verse, Joel 2, 11, the Lord utters his voice before the army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? God himself is leading this army of judgment. Jesus himself, who executes God's word, is powerful. Therefore, this day of the Lord is very great, very awesome, and the answer to the question is no one, no one can endure it. This is the final judgment when all sin is judged and all sinners are found wanting. And we, even we, we who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. We, too, are to fear this day. Why? 
Not because it'll fall on us, and certainly not because we disparage justice. We want the grossest of sins to be judged. We, we don't want child molesters and serial killers and mass murderers and genociders, genociders. We don't want them to get off scot-free. We, we, we don't disparage justice, but we fear this day because we fear for the people around us and long for them to be rescued from this day as we have been. Why must there be the judgment of the day of the Lord? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why must there be the rescue of the day of the Lord? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and cannot rescue themselves. The good news is that though this will be a period of judgment, when justice is served, it's also a time of rescue, when grace is extended. Grace is already being extended to us to escape this judgment. Joel is going to tell us this absolutely beautifully, starting in verse 12 next week, and he'll show it throughout the rest of this book. And we'll, we'll get to that good news next week. But I want to close with a quick sketch of the many other places where the day of the Lord is a day of rescue. So the first appearance of the day of the Lord is in the book of Isaiah. His clear description, doom, deep darkness, the dread super soul of judgment, but he also talks a lot about the rescues. There are at least four elements and times of rescue woven into his pictures and woven into those of the other prophets. One, immediate or near-term rescue from a day of the Lord that has sent them into exile or judgment. So immediate rescue. Two, rescue through faith in Jesus, the, the ultimate rescue of individuals. Three, Rescue from the great battle of the last days into the thousand-year reign of Jesus. And four, rescue from the final judgment into the glory of the new heavens and the new earth. So I would dearly love to lay these four elements out and give you one concrete verse from the minor prophets for each of them. But from the perspective of these Old Testament prophets, all these things were, were distant waves rushing toward them, and God the Holy Spirit, for whatever reason, did not choose to allow the prophets to much distinguish between the closer waves of immediate judgment and the more remote ones of ultimate rescue. But what he did instead, the Spirit of God in giving these prophets these words, the beauty he revealed to us is utterly awesome. So I want to spend the rest of our time just sharing slowly a few of our favorites. A lot of scriptures, you can write them down if you want to, or just, just, just worship the goodness of the Lord, the day of the Lord to rescue. Isaiah 10, for example. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but they will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. So this is probably immediate rescue after the Babylonian exile. Later in Isaiah 35, great verse, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will be on their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Good, good news about that day of immediate rescue and great news about the day that is yet to come. But in his incarnation and in his work, Jesus is also that day in these prophecies. In Isaiah 11, he is the root and branch of Jesse. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verses used of Jesus in the New Testament. Later in the same chapter, 
In that day, the root of Jesse, Jesus, shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant, the remains of his people, from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathos, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. This is Jesus who rescues and restores the people of Israel in that last day and in preparation for his thousand-year reign. But that day also looks forward to the details of his saving work. Zechariah 12 says, On that day I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on the one they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. This is the mourning, the grieving of those who look to the cross and recognize that there he was pierced for our transgressions. In the next chapter, on that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. That's the work of Jesus, the one who they pierced, cleanses them, cleanses us, offers us forgiveness and new life. So, Isaiah 12, you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though with your, you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust, I will have faith, I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. All who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved now and on that day. Other prophecies point to the restoration of Israel probably during the thousand-year reign of Christ, thus described in the book of Revelation, Micah 4, 6, and 7. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. Jesus will reign. Zephaniah 3, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart. This is a day of rescue. This is a day of happiness. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. (laughs) Jesus reigns on earth. You shall never again fear evil evil. On that way, day it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. He says, I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. And yet there is an even greater rescue to come at the end of that thousand years when the day of the Lord comes to final conclusion, because the day of the Lord is this whole time period, comes to final conclusion in the last judgment of rebellious men and spiritual beings and the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness forever. We've already heard Isaiah 24. On that day... The Lord will punish the host of heaven and heaven and the kings of the earth on earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison and for many days they will be punished. So that's that's the punishment of the wicked. But, (laughs) but, this is perhaps my favorite section that we're going to talk about today. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, in that day. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined, that banquet with Jesus. 
and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That day is the day of ultimate rescue. And boy, we look forward to it. Boy, it's a glorious day. So what have we said? Joel warns of the coming day of the Lord, and he warns of the day of judgment, this day of darkness and gloom, of clouds and thick darkness. He paints a grim picture where the destruction of the earth by armies is like the worst locust nightmare ever conceived. So great is this judgment that no one can endure it. And that's real. There will be that day of the Lord in its horror and in its fear that those, we fear, that those who have not called on the name of the Lord will suffer from us, from it. It's a warning to us who believe that there are people all around us for whom that judgment will be the ultimate reality. This is the effect of sin. All have sinned. But for those who trust in him, neither Joel nor the prophets can leave the picture there. And we've just heard. They look forward not just to the judgment, but to the rescue. That all who put their saving trust in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the righteous branch, the root of Jesse, all will be saved. And the saved will be gathered, not only into his return and earthly reign, but into the new heavens and the new earth, the home of righteousness forever, (laughs) where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. Friends, this is a theme we need to know. If you're a believer today, you need to know that there is a day of the Lord for judgment, but the day of the Lord for rescue is near as well. The day of the Lord is a day of darkness and gloom and a beautiful day of rescue. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we do need to know this. Lord God, I look at people on the street every day without thinking through what's going to happen. Lord God, I I pray that as aliens and strangers destined for that great world to come, we would fear, I pray that we would fear and cry out for those around us who do not yet know you as Savior, who face the full impact of the day of the Lord for judgment. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be quick to show them the way of rescue. And that we would be quick to celebrate, to praise you for the rescue that you've promised. Thank you, Jesus. In your name. Amen.